Welcome to the Rising Laterally podcast. Each episode, you will learn something fascinating so you can bring big ideas to your small talk. Your growth is our growth. Listening to these episodes, subscribing to our weekly newsletter, engaging our posts on social media, and sharing our show with your friends and family is deeply appreciated as we work hard to expand this platform. You can also visit our page at buymeacoffee.com to contribute what you think the show is worth. To the folks who are taking this step, we can't thank you enough. Look for the link in our show notes for more details about how you can support and follow us. And now, please enjoy this episode. What do you think is the greatest invention of all time? It's a great question. I have been thinking about it a lot in the last 48 hours or so here. A lot of inventions came to mind, especially given the situation we're in now, there's just been so much uh, new, innovative, revolutionary technologies that have been created in like the last 150 years alone. Thinking of the airplane as a potential one to talk about today, you know, it's allowed us to take transcontinental trips in a single day that a few hundred years ago would have taken months and months of hard travel at sea. So across our lifetimes now, we can see so much more of the world uh, than we could have before the airplane. That was one that really excited me. The other one was the word processor. You know, as someone who writes a lot, journals a lot, um, you know, it's allowed us to notate and organize our thoughts at a rate that was never possible with pen and paper alone to be able to move your writing around in a digital space, cut and copy, edit, delete, be able to so easily revise your thoughts, never write an illegible word. I just can't imagine how frustrated I would feel in a world where everything had to be handwritten. I think that would be just such a tremendous handicap on self-expression. Uh, the other one that came to mind was the internet. Obviously enough said there, uh, but the invention that I wanted to talk about today, one that's actually most dear to me, that is the invention of sound recording because I couldn't imagine living in a world where I didn't have access on demand to music. But before I talk about the invention I came here to talk about today, maybe I'll throw it back to you, Arjun, because I know I've been going on for a little while here. What was the invention that came to mind for you? Well, I used to ask this question to a lot of people for a long time, like when I was in my 20s. Uh, My answer would always be soap. Soap as the greatest invention of all time. (laughs) <laughs> imagine not expected that one <laughs> imagine imagine life without something that you know you can clean yourself off with imagine how dirty everything and everyone was i mean it was probably actually dangerous and can you actually think about how things used to smell back in the day i mean all you had was water and they would use sand or mud or even like wood ash and that was it you know research actually suggests that the ancient mesopotamians were first to produce a kind of soap, they used wood ash and they used fatty acids from cows, sheep, and goats. And it lifted dirt away. Even if it was like a smelly and greasy little blob, it actually lifted dirt away. Um, And at first, soap was used to clean wool and cotton fibers. It was used because they wanted to get that clean before they go weave it into cloth. It wasn't even used for human hygiene at first. But yeah, Back in the day, I mean, they would just use um, like the water baths that I was describing, and then they would use scented olive oils, and then they would have like this metal scraper that would remove any oil or grime. So that's how they used to bathe back in the day. Um, and by the Middle Ages, new vegetable oil-based soaps, they were milder and they smelled better. So they became the luxury item in mm. Europe. Um, so these soaps were being produced in Syria. They were brought over to Europe. And then from there, different versions of soap started to spread all over the world. And actually, if you look at the history of soap, something that's really interesting is that the settlement of the American colonies coincided with an age when most Europeans turned away from regular bathing out of fear that water actually spreads disease. Mm. Mm. If you actually research ancient ways of bathing, you'll see that it was pretty gross very communal and you'll understand like why people actually just stiff armed bathing for a long long time there's actually a book called foul bodies it's written by kathleen brown she's a professor of history at upenn Hmm. and she writes about the early colonial days and about the cleanliness of america i didn't read the book but that's 
out there and it would relate to this topic. But then soap factories started appearing. There was Colgate in New York in 1807. There was Procter and Gamble in Cincinnati in 1837. And they started to produce soap at a larger scale, even though, as mentioned earlier, Americans were kind of shunning soap just because of the way like they were being taught from the Europeans. Mm. Um, and in fact, actually, the early days, soap was just hand in hand with uh, candle making. And it was used for laundry and stuff like that. And it turns out that it was around the Civil War period, where that was the point where people started to regularly wash with water and soap as a sanitary measure. Mm. Uh, and that's when like personal hygiene, like really caught on as a thing to be doing. And the demand for soap really grew. And if you actually dig deeper into that, I think there's an element of people will do whatever is acceptable in society. Yeah, if it's acceptable in society, just go about your day without cleansing, then no one cared and everyone followed along. And then all of a sudden people are like, I feel a lot better. I'm clean. And by the way, fewer people are dying because we're all cleaner. Um, mm -hmm. And then that caught on, right? So it's just interesting to think about the like, human psychology. And so you know, that's something to add to your ammo as you think about anytime you're talking to people about human behavior, human psychology at a community level, you can throw that in there. Um, and then fast forward to today. I mean, as you know, you go in the soap aisle, the soap chemistry is, you know, vastly different. There's highly specialized soaps. There's super engineered products now. And the global soap market was $34 billion in 2019. It's projected to reach $55 billion by 2027. Um, yeah, increasing demand for natural and handcrafted products, increasing usage of liquid soaps, and a rising awareness regarding health and hygiene are all factors fueling the expected market growth. So soap, I mean, it seems so ordinary to many pe people, but if you think about it, billions of people right now on this planet continue to suffer from poor access to hygiene or even clean drinking water. And it mm -hmm. wasn't even until the 1840s or, and the 1850s when doctors and nurses were mandating to wash their hands or mandated, I should say, to, to wash their hands. So soap, it's a luxury, but by God, it is one of the best inventions of all time. Yeah, no, dude, fair. That's very fair. We definitely live in a very clean world relative to where we were at. I think that's one of the most invisible luxuries, like the idea of showering every day of being clean when you present yourself to the public. That's just sort of table stakes now, but people probably like smelled pretty bad for most of human history if they weren't bathing. And if they were bathing, it was only, it was with water and with other people. Uh, I think I, I read something like people weren't bathing regularly, like, like weren't bathing every day until the late 1800s. So very commonly, even up until like the civil war, people, we're bathing maybe like once a month or like in some situation, like once every couple months, I think we were so used to like that shower ritual, either in the morning or night or after we work out and like being clean and being scrubbed down and people just existed without ever having that feeling. Um, it's definitely one of the great luxuries of the modern age that goes under discussed for sure. Yeah. And there's still billions of people today that don't have access to water soap so yeah well but back yeah. to sound recording yeah. <laughs> yeah so i landed on this one because as i mentioned you know earlier i'm a huge fan of music like most people i actually have some stats around how prevalent music listening is today almost everyone listens to music but for me personally you know i got the iphone i got the headphones in regardless of what i'm doing laundry you know listening to music working out listening to music I'm in a bad mood. I need to go out, go and blow off some steam. I'm going to go for a walk and listen to music. I know a lot of friends that have sort of a similar form of self-therapy with music. I think music is just such a mood elevator. It can completely transform your headspace. You know, you throw those headphones in and literally your brainwaves are instantly on a different wavelength. And I just think it's really one of the great privileges of the 21st century that we've democratized access to music in this way. We can listen to music really at any point in the day, any kind of music we want. And to get into the history here, before the invention of sound recording, it's logical if you think about it, the only time that you were able to listen to music was when it was being performed live in front of you or you were playing it yourself. 
which is to say access to music was very limited for much of history. The vast majority of people didn't know about any music that was being made beyond their own town. If it wasn't being made in their own town or their own village, they didn't know about it. So people living in London, England had absolutely no idea what kind of music was being made in Bogota, Colombia. They probably didn't even know what music was being made across the English Channel in Paris. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach is actually a great example of this. He's a very well-known name now. You might recognize it. He's considered one of the great composers of all time. But he was an obscure name in Europe during the years he was performing, uh, you know, the years of his life in the 1700s. He was not very well known outside of East Germany where he worked. So again, music just was not as ubiquitous as it was today. If you wanted to hear music, you actually had to go to the opera or you had to go to church to hear, you know, the hymnal music from the organs. Or if you were very wealthy, you would hire a private orchestra to come play in your home. But the vast majority of people obviously didn't have the money for that kind of thing. So there was, it was probably a much quieter world than the one we're in now. Fast forward to the late 1800s, the steam-driven printing presses made sheet music for the first time cheap enough to be profitable as a mass market item. So all this sheet music started to getting printed. And this was also the period of time when most every middle-class home had some kind of piano in it. So you could ride your horse into town, you buy a book of sheet music, you learn how to play it on the piano, and then you play it for your family during the leisure hours of the evening. And music was becoming much more widely consumed in that way. But again, it's still kind of the same problem. If you wanted to hear music, you actually had to play it yourself on the piano. It's just a lot of work relative to just opening up Spotify on your phone. I suppose the, the flip side of that is that there are probably a lot more competent, skilled musicians back in those days, but it was- Think about that though. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. He, what a yeah. hero. What a hero. Right, right. exactly. This guy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You're the one who actually took the time, learned an instrument, became proficient at it enough to read all kinds of songs off sheet music, People, there wasn't a lot to do back then. So if you could play the piano well and entertain your family or your your neighborhood in that way, you probably were a hero. People, people were probably very grateful for that. Yeah. So, so, uh, so that was, I, I suppose, one plus in the category of life before sound recording. That does get us to the invention of the first sound recording in 1877. Thomas Edison modeled the first phonograph and recorded his voice onto a cylindrical record. So the first words ever recorded were actually spoken by Edison himself. They were, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Everywhere the child went, the little lamb was sure to go. No way. You can actually, you can actually still, yeah, you can look it up and you can still hear it today. The audio quality is, is not so good as you might imagine, but it was an incredible innovation. He went on to do other things. He was you know, an incredibly prolific inventor, so... I think he maybe didn't realize what he had there, or he was more interested in some of the other projects he was working on. So he kind of put sound recording on the side, and it got picked up by a German-American inventor, Emil Berliner, who 10 years later in 1887 innovated on Edison's invention and developed a method to record onto a lateral cut flat disc record. So no longer a cylinder like Edison had, it's a flat disc was exceptionally thick, but beyond the thickness, it looked very similar to the vinyl records that we're all used to today. And thanks to Emil Berliner, the sound quality was much improved. And then the last kind of pit stop here on the timeline I wanted to dig into was in 1925, when electrical recording overtook acoustic recording. So up until 1925, acoustic recording meant one performance, one record. The band had to gather around this big metal flared horn that took in their sound. They're all crowded around it. And whatever they played was printed directly onto the record. And that was that. So if you wanted to make 10 records, you had to play the song 10 times. Incredibly arduous. Electrical recording meant musicians were no longer gathering around a big metal flared horn. They were playing into microphones, just like musicians do today. And they could create as many records as they wanted out of a single performance. So one recording, a million records. You can imagine just how much that shifted the economics of sound recording. There are a lot of big milestones after that. You got the cassette tape in 1963, the Walkman in 1979. 
in October of 2001, as a lot of people will recall, Apple introduced the first generation iPod with the slogan, a thousand songs in your pocket. That was huge. I think we can all remember the ads with the dancing silhouettes. And then Spotify was founded in Sweden in 2006, uh, which is sort of the preeminent streaming service today. And here we are. The, the stat that I had foreshadowed earlier came from Statisa. It took a survey of Americans in 2019, and the results were that 51% of U.S. adults listen to music every single day, and 92% of adults report listening to music at some frequency, be it every day or a few times a week. So from my vantage point, like I think everyone likes music. Almost everyone consumes music in the developed world, it looks like. In a click of a button, you have access to any artist, any genre from any time period. We can go back and listen to Beethoven, you know, whose work was never actually recorded in the years that he wrote and performed. And now it's all there, thanks to many of the wonderful orchestras out there. Listen to Rolling Stones. We can listen to Kendrick Lamar. You know, I think music transcends all walks of life and for its ubiquity and for, I think, all it's done for us psychologically, I think sound recording is the greatest invention of all time. Nice. I love music. And there's so much to actually talk about there. You know, you mentioned at the very end, kind of the timeline where the iPod came into play and Spotify. So I just want to start there because Mm -hmm. if you think about in a world of technology, people and founders and innovators are thinking about like the process of bundling, unbundling and rebundling. So when I think about it in the music context, this is an analogy that I heard from someone else. I wish I could remember who said it, but basically it's like, think about this. Music used to get bundled into CDs, which were unbundled into either 99 cent songs or the iPod, which then created individual songs, which are re- now you can rebundle as custom playlists. Hmm. Interesting. So, I'm just trying to tie the knot or create a connection between that timeline and also the process of just bundling, unbundling and rebundling. And then that's probably a thought process to carry forward in the future. Like what right now is bundled that can be unbundled and then rebundled? That might be something to think about. Also, yeah, I'm sure there's so many examples from like creating a taste-based playlist around movies or shows. I use this website, Taste Dive. That's a recommendation for anyone out there that's looking for new content uh, that doesn't feel that the Netflix algorithm is working for them. People curate these playlists of movies and they're actually really good. Like if you type in a movie that you like, you can see other movies like that. And a lot of times the recommendations from what I've seen are on point. So I think that's an example of rebundling. There you go. Mm-hmm. I was also thinking about in the context of like investing. And if you think about stocks being bundled into mutual funds or ETFs, which then get unbundled into individual holdings, which you could rebundle into a customized, separately managed account for your client. Mm. Yeah. So as long, I think in a world and an era where customization is becoming key, that rebundling, what you rebundle as, if it's customized and personalized, then that resonates in society. Totally. So that's one thread that I was trying to pull off of what you were saying. I also was thinking about like, imagine the musicians who were never actually recorded um, and how good they were, but no one has ever actually heard them. But that's a separate yeah, side. That's a, that's a great point, especially the vocal vocal artists because maybe their music can be recreated on the piano or violin and maybe sounds pretty similar how they played it but every voice is unique there were obviously just like there are now there were some incredible voices throughout the generations that we will never hear yeah wild to think about and then the other thing you were talking about was back in 1925 you're going from acoustic to electronic or electrical um so I'm under the impression that that means if you wanted to have 10 records, you have to basically nail these because if you don't get the song right, then you just spend extra money in the studio and you probably can't afford to do that. So the stakes are a lot higher than two. And one of the first things you mentioned to kick off the conversation was the airplane. Mm. And you're talking about high stakes and airplanes. 
think about this past weekend if you were in the bay area and you saw the blue angels mm -hmm. which i did <laughs> which you did <laughs> like those airplanes are there's a lot of high stakes for those <laughs> those pilots and everything like that so connecting the dots with whatever has been said and what's going on in the world with sound recording i think that's where my mind is going and what's really interesting is obviously this has to do with music it could also lead into music but it leads into another great invention i want to put on the table all right let's do it it's something that I recently started thinking about after I heard Noam Chomsky talk about it, but it's the alphabet, hmm. any alphabet in any language, but the principle of like the set of characters that were developed, like for the purpose of this discussion, let's just talk about the 26 letters that are used in the English language. Mm -hmm. If you think about it with a few characters we can express in English what's happening in our brains. And as Chomsky put it, we captured the capacity to produce language, and that was through the use of an alphabet. Hmm. So call it an innovation, call it an invention. When humans developed an alphabet to capture the capacity to produce language, that's what you need to think about this week. That should spark inner creativity, inner empowerment, inner motivation. Like you are human and think about what humans are capable of. And if you look at the history of the alphabet, it actually goes back to the consonantal hmm. writing system that was used for Semitic languages back in the second millennium BC. So Semitic languages are a branch of the Afro-Asiatic language family. It's spoken by more than 330 million people across the across the world. Most of these folks are in West Asia, the Horn of Africa, Malta, and North Africa. So if you think about languages like Arabic, Hebrew, or Amarania, which I learned is a language that's commonly used in Ethiopia. Um, but origins of the alphabet go back to ancient Egypt, where unskilled workers who couldn't grasp the complex hieroglyphic system, they mm. just started to select small number of those pictograms that actually applied to what they were seeing in the world commonly. And that's how their own language was born. What's interesting is that vowels were mostly unwritten. Mm. So hieroglyphs, they usually indicated a single consonant sound. Mm. But by at least the 8th century BC, the Greeks created the first quote unquote true alphabet where vowels and consonants were included and were treated equal, lack of a better phrase. But Greek is basically the source of all the modern scripts of Europe. But when you look at the Latins who became the Romans, they adapted different sounds and modified the alphabet even more. There's actually a ton of information online about what letters became what in terms of their sounds and if you really think about it, there's an interesting relationship in terms of all the various scripts and how they all developed and evolved on each other into the modern letters and sounds that we use today. So for example, the letters C, K, and Q in the Roman alphabet could all be used to write both the K sound and the G sound. So like K, like kite and K, like gift. They also mm. modified the C to make G, inserted it in the seventh place where Z used to be. Mm. And then a few centuries after Alexander the Great conquered Eastern Mediterranean and the areas around there in the third century BC, the Romans began to borrow Greek words. So they actually had to adapt their alphabet again to write these words. And it's from there, it's from the Eastern Greek alphabet. They actually borrowed the letters Y and Z they added it to the end of the alphabet because the only time they were used was to write Greek words. Interesting. Right? Interesting. Another interesting thing is the order of the letters of the alphabet, which goes back to the 14th century BC and actually originated near Syria's northern coast. And researchers, they actually found tablets that show identical or very similar orders in terms of the letters that are used in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and, and in Ethiopia as well. So when you think about writing, movies, music, sound recording, like all, you know, all of these are obviously incredible human inventions. It ties back to letters and the alphabet. 
And if you consider language like even deeper, you realize it's really mysterious. And it becomes even more mysterious when you consider that many things have happened only once and by accident for us to become the species that, that we are. Mm. So I recommend people to go watch a YouTube video called Mind Your Language, Thought, Metaphor, and Imagination. It might blow your mind. It blew my mind. But Brian Green, he chats with Chomsky, Steven Pinker, Evelina Fedorenko, and Daniel Dorr. And they talk about the foundations of language. And it's really, really interesting. So I'm going with soap and the alphabet as the two greatest inventions of all time. Nice. I like that. Well, there's an interesting symmetry there, too, between the alphabet and music in the sense that the alphabet, the letters themselves are the building blocks for language, but individually the letters don't really mean anything. So like you take a Mm. K and you look at it in isolation, it's just sort of this arbitrary symbol. It only has value and meaning when it's put in the context of other letters. And the same is true for music. Like if I just played you one note on a piano that wouldn't really evoke any emotion. But when I play that note and then two other that it has some harmonic relationship with, now we're getting somewhere. And uh, and just like the alphabet evolved to be able to take on new words and you know communicate more complicated ideas, the same thing happened with music. You know, in the early days of music, people were just playing drums. It was like atonal, it was just sounds. And then people discovered that there was this whole range of tones and they had different relationships with each other. You know, in the early days of music, people were not thinking at, on like the sophisticated levels that the composers of the classical age were thinking of, or, you know, great sound engineers are thinking on today. Like people were thinking in terms of very basic harmonic relationships. And uh, again, all the building blocks were there, but they didn't know quite how to put them together to create something that was sophisticated. And I just think that there's an interesting parallel between how humanity, you know, evolved to make use of these linguistic building blocks and create ever more complicated things, just like we did with sounds and tones. Yes. So, dude, I'm happy that we're, uh, we're here on earth and we're in the species that we're in. And to your point, like history was not guaranteed. A lot of these things may not have happened just because we evolved into these creatures doesn't mean we would have stumbled on the innovations that we have. So there's just a lot to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is make this question, your small talk, like what do you think is the best invention of all time? It's a great question because almost every answer is fascinating and it's hard to have a conversation that will not bring you closer to the person that you're talking with. Totally. So Thank you for joining in on the fun. Goodbye, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, you can sign up for the Rising Weekly newsletter sent out each week. Every Friday, we expand on the episode with insights, recommendations, and more. You can sign up at risingladderly.com. Thank you.